This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cooty, and Husker Radio Network analyst, Jeremiah Searles. We are back. Season three of the Sideline Slice with Jeremiah Searles. I'm Jessica Cooty. So excited to be back for another season of this podcast brought to you by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. And Searles, can you believe it? We have a football game that we get to talk about today. We made it. Oh, we finally <laughs> made it. It's been just horrible. No football, no fresh cut grass, no planting my butt in a couch on Saturday and Sunday and being a bad parent. Like, I am so excited the football's back. 23 weekends from now until February, we will have football. So how it's normally going to go is we will drop this podcast on Tuesdays, but being that this Season is kicking off on a Thursday night. Everything's moved forward a little bit, but we're going to normally record on Tuesdays, as we've done in the past, to give Searles a couple days to really dive into the film. He's a nerd like that. But for this week, we're giving it to you a little bit early. So we are going to talk about Minnesota and uh, get you set for that and in, in kick off in the season opener. But uh, before we get to that, um, we have had an announcement this week, and we kind of talked about it a little bit when you, you were with me on Sports Nightly, but you're going to get to call a couple games with us this season. Yes, I get to be lucky enough to beside the one and only Greg Sharp, the voice <laughs> of the Huskers, as the color analyst for the CU game and the Illinois this game, Illinois game this year. And I'll tell you this, I haven't backed a Folsom since 2009 when we beat them there, and I can't wait to go back to that hellhole. I cannot <laughs> wait to walk back into Boulder and hopefully see the Sea of Red take over that stadium again because, listen, I don't have a lot of hate in my heart, but CU, <laughs> CU's got a real nice place right there for the hate in the heart. Oh, I love it. I love it. Which We'll talk all about that, and Searle's family all wanted him to be a buff, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, yep. we'll, we'll get into all of that next week. Hard to believe that's next week. But uh, for now, we're going we're gonna to focus on Minnesota because – just like the coaching staff and this team, we got to take it one week at a time, hey, right? But before, before we really get into the X's and O's of the Gophers, you've been out to a couple practices. What were your big takeaways? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing that I'm going to take away from looking at this from spring ball into training camp, and now what I'm going to be looking for as we head into week one, you know, is just the flow of which this team practices and the flow of which they want to play. Right, and I think that's going to be tempo, smash mouth, and then on defense, just create chaos and havoc. Right, just continue to throw different things at them as an offense. Continue to just try and make Jeff Sims be a, a weapon with his legs. You know, I'm as much curious to see what this offense for the Huskers looks like as I am the defense. You know, but for me, I think that's a good thing because that means Minnesota is wondering the same thing too. And, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of power running game from our backs because we've talked about it a lot in this offseason. I think the running back room is the strength of this offense right now. You know, and you pair that with a veteran offensive line and getting guys back, and hopefully Teddy can be back. Hopefully we'll get some guys back that can be road graders and go up there. And whenever you open on the road, you got to open with a physical presence because there's going to be all kinds of chaos that's going on, everyone learning how to go through the flow of a game. You want to make sure you can go back, rely on your physicality, your ability to run the football and you're going to have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Minnesota, who all they want to do is run the football. So we'll, we'll know a little bit more about this when this thing gets kicked off, but one of the things that's kind of hindered this team in these close games is the mental mistakes and not keeping the pedal to the metal, right, and, the, and being disciplined and, and all of that, and, and all things that Matt Rule and his coaching staff have hung their hat on for years and years. How have you seen that? How much do you feel good about that regard and, and this team being more improved in that of, of eliminating more of those mental mistakes and being disciplined in those critical moments? Yeah, you know, it's something that Coach Rule has harped on at every practice I've been to. I've heard him talk about it in almost every single press conference he's been in. You know, he understands that the margin for winning in a football game is razor thin and that mental errors and unforced penalties and little things like that that happen in the first quarter, they compound and they add up to losing games in the fourth quarter. And so, you know, that's been a thing that he's been very, very passionate about talking with, and that flows over into your team. And, you know, I, I saw an interview that he had 
where he was talking about like, hey, Matt Rule, how long does it take for you to flip this thing around? He's like, well, if it's Matt Rule's team, it takes two to three years. You know, but he was like, if these juniors and seniors take control of this team, like we could be really special and compete this year. And I think that's a great point. You know, he has installed what he believes is his culture. It's now up to the juniors and the seniors of this team that have bought into this culture to now cultivate it and to grow it and to show the young guys. And if they can do that quickly, and that's by playing football the right way, playing smart football, not taking dumb penalties, leading when things go through adversity. If they can do that, I really do think this football team has a chance to win some good games this year. So on that note, on those juniors and seniors that you're referring to, uh, those single digits have been handed out. Uh, still waiting on a few more. It might drop by the time we drop this podcast. But Probably. you know, but three three linebackers. I mean, the linebackers have really taken over those single digit numbers. I mean, you look at Nick Henrich, Luke Reimer, John Bullock. Uh, what, what's your takeaway on that? And then Big Nash wearing zero. You got to love that. But the fact that, you know, a lot of those are defensive players and then th that linebacking core, which when you're talking about that culture and making sure that things are going right on the football field, a lot of it is going to be probably relying on those linebackers. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the quarterback of the defense, it's the linebacking crew. And we've talked about it a lot, too, through the offseason as well. That's the strength of this defense, right? You look at who has the most playtime, who has the most TFLs, who has the most production. Like, it's the linebacking group. They played together. You talk about Henrich and Reimer playing in there together for so many games. And, you know, Bullock in there coming in as being the guy to step up into that new role. And then even we haven't even talked about MJ Sherman, Chief Borders. Like there's so many names in that linebacking room that I'm so excited to see in which ways Tony White's going to allow them to contribute and allow them to blitz and allow them to drop into coverage and do all kinds of things. That's a great room. And I love the new, I love the single digit tradition that he's bringing here. I think it's great when you have your own peers voted on something, right? It's not from the coaches. It's not so the media thinks, oh, this guy's going to be good, right? When you earn a, a captain vote or you earn something on a team that is voted on by your peers, that's the greatest honor you can get as a player. Like nothing else, the All-American, all that stuff is great. But when you have a group of over 100 guys that all vote and say, no, you have done things right. I want to play like you. I want to contribute like you. That's the greatest honor you can get. So all those guys, well, I mean, super proud of all those guys. I'm super excited for all them. And, yeah, that might be the biggest number zero jersey that's ever been made <laughs> at the University of Nebraska. <laughs> I think he had to wear a large. They had to get him a bigger size, the, the zero that yeah. he had on. They, like don't, they don't usually top. make zeros in 3XLs. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a common thing that's made here. <laughs> hey, is Nick Henrich the new Forever College? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're running out of guys, thankfully. I'm so happy this COVID nonsense is ending. You know, but it's like the Van Wilders of the world are still sticking around in there. So, yeah, he's definitely college forever this year. I, gave him, I was giving him a hard time about that this summer because he was uh, joking about Will Honus being the old guy. I'm like, well, you're kind of the old guy now, too. You've been around a few years, too. So he was, he was embracing it. So I feel like he's all right with that. Hey, you're going up to Minnesota. You love going up there. That's one of your favorite I'll cities. I love Minneapolis. Yeah, I get a chance to, my wife and I are going up on the booster trip. Coach uh, Brendan Stye is bringing us up. Coach you know, Brendan Stye? He was my coach. You have to remember, he was a coach for me. Like, it's hard for me. Whenever someone was a coach in my life, it's hard for me not to put coach in front of their name. <laughs> or else I feel like I'm going to get yelled at. Um, but, yeah, Coach Stai, um invited myself and Emma. We're going to come up on the booster trip, fly up and talk with the boosters, present, kind of show some X's and O's what I think this team's going to be. And they get a chance to go back into the stadium where I started my Viking career and where I've repped some players out of. And I have a lot of respect for that gopher program. Um, I have a lot of respect for the way they play football, but I'm also so I do love Minneapolis. I love any time I can get up there. Well, big reason why you have a lot of respect for that program is because what they do on the offensive line, mm -hmm. which you've maintained and been a pretty big fan of, I think, since we've started this podcast. So what is it about the way that they do things up front that um, continues to allow for them to do what they do? You know, I think what's you never hear like big transfers in, big transfers out from Minnesota. They've grown that offensive line in-house internally. And they have year after year guys that have been in their system, been in their weight program, been developed, that now are plugging into starters. Right? You know, two years ago, they lost four starters, and they only had their center that came back, and they didn't miss a beat. Right? And this year, I think they only lost two starters on that offensive line from last year. And so I'll be curious to see how they fill those roles. But the scheme in which they run, they just need big bodies that run laterally and play assignment football. And they've had really good backs in the past that have known how to work with that and do well. 
and their offense is arguably the most boring offense in the country to watch, but they're effective, right? I think back to the Denzel Washington quote from uh, Remember the Titans. They're like, just like Novocaine, just give it enough time, it always works, right? And that's what they do. They just run mid-zone, mid-zone, mid-zone over and over again, and then they play action and pop pass. Like, it's not a simple – it's not an – it's not an extravagant formula. It's very simple, but they're very good at doing it, and they execute it at a very high level, and they limit possessions, right? They limit possessions so that if they can get a lead, it's really hard for an offense of the opposing team to get the ball back and score two touchdowns or three scores in the second half just with the style of football that they play. You know, you look at last year, and defensively, they were top 10 in the nation in total defense, top five in scoring defense, one of the best teams on, on third down stops. Their offense has a lot to do with that, right? Yeah, their offense has a lot to do with that because you limit snaps for a defense, right? I mean, when you say a defense only has to play 55 snaps a game or 50 snaps a game, like, that's huge. They're, there's less opportunity for big plays. They get to stay fresh, right? Versus on the flip side, so many times, for example, if you have a team that's a, a tempo offense that's going three and out all the time, those snaps on defense are now 75 to 80 to sometimes 100. And it's hard to ask a defensive player to go out there and play 100 snaps and stop an offense. You know, so, yeah, they play great complementary football. You know, and I think that's what P.J. Fleck coaches up there is, hey, everyone, offense, defense, special teams, we all complement each other in very unique ways, which then allows us to play the style of football that we want. Very rarely do you see a Minnesota team fall behind by – three scores and have to throw it all over the yard to come back. They're always in it there at the end of the game in the fourth quarter just because they've worked so well through the first three quarters to give them a chance to win it at the end of the game because it's usually a one-possession game. Valentino's, a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else. What started with a treasured family recipe in Lincoln, Nebraska, has become a classic Italian tradition for 65 years. Well, no Tanner Morgan for the first time since... Nom. <laughs> So, but, you know, he goes out. Ty Robinson knocks him out of the game last year. Huskers were up 10 nothing, And then Ethan Kaliak manis comes in, and he, boy, he made uh, Minnesota look a lot better. They ended up winning that game. But what, what have you seen out of Ethan, that quarterback? He's one of the few returning quarterbacks, I guess, that, that saw time last year in the Big Ten with so much turnover at that position. But uh, what can we expect to see from the Gophers quarterback? Yeah, you know, I think – one thing that Minnesota hasn't had under Tanner Morgan was the quarterback mobility, right? Tanner was good enough to escape and gain three or four yards and pick up a positive play. But, you know, this young kid, I'm not even going to try and keep pronouncing his name because I butcher it every single time. But this, this young kid is able to come in and he can use his legs as a weapon, right? So, so many now of these mid zones that they run that were forever and always a 100% give read, you're now going to have a lot of reading of, hey, you got to respect the quarterback pulling that and getting to the edge, right? You have to respect, make sure we set an edge on the backside. So if he does pull it, he's not streaking up the sideline because he does have some good speed. He has some good wheels to him. I don't think he's as polished as a passer. But again, that's why if I'm thinking, okay, young quarterback, really his first time going through an entire offseason and training camp as the starter, let's see if we can test this guy and make him throw a little bit by getting him behind the sticks, getting them in second and nine, third and ten, and seeing if he still polishes a passer. Because that was things last year, he wasn't very he – was, he had a tendency to miss high, right? And when you miss high, you throw interceptions. So I want to see if he's gotten that cleaned up. I want to test him a little bit with his IQ, and I'm sure Tony White's going to throw everything at the book at him. There's no holding anything back, right? Some people are like, oh, first game, you don't want to show everything. No, 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 no. Tony White's going to empty the playbook at this dude and see if he can handle it. But we just got to make sure we say um, – it's disciplined in our rush lanes, stay disciplined in our contain, and just not allow him to use his feet as a weapon to hurt us. So, so that brings up a, a thought for me that I wanted to ask you. So, you know, Minnesota's got a mobile quarterback. Nebraska's got a mobile quarterback. What does it do for an offensive line? Like, how do you approach preparing for an offense when you do have a quarterback that can use his feet more? It's a blessing and a curse. You know, so many times a mobile quarterback can get you out of trouble as an offensive line, right? You can give up a quick beat on a pass protection, and he'll make something miraculous, right? Taylor Martinez reminded me of that. We had a, a Big Ten championship game. We had a full slide right call on our right guard, misheard and slid left, and the three technique escaped, and all of a sudden Taylor escaped for an 85-yard touchdown run. Right? Like Those are the things a mobile quarterback can bring for you. Where it's a curse at times is sometimes they try and create a little too much, right? You're playing tackle. You've got your guys locked up, and he doesn't get rid of the ball, so he tries to escape around the outside, and all of a sudden you give up a sack or you give up a holding penalty or whatever it may be because – He's running around back there. But, you know, as an offensive lineman, you have to understand, too, if I have a mobile quarterback, i got to stick on my block a lot longer. 
I got to know that, hey, this guy can escape through any gap at any time to try and create with his legs. So I can't think in a, have an internal clock in my head that's like, hey, one, two, three, ball gone, right, if it's a pass player and those type of things. And so you just have to really take that into consideration um, when it comes with that. And that's something that Minnesota hasn't had. You know, last year, Casey was somewhat mobile for us. He was mobile enough to get the job done. But Jeff Sims is an entirely different beast when it comes to running the football and what he can do with his legs and just how big and powerful he is. In terms of running back, you were a big, big fan of Mo Ibrahim, and he is no longer at Minnesota. What do you, what kind of sense do you get of what they're going to do at the run game? I'm not sure. You know, they lost a couple guys. Potts was gone, you know, but the thing about Minnesota is they always seem to reload at that position. Now, granted, Mo Ibrahim, again, he was there forever, but, you know, I think they're going to have a rotation of backs like they always have. They always have three to four backs that they rotate in there. All of them usually different skill sets. You usually have a burner. You have your power back. You kind of have your all-around back. You know, so I'll be curious to see what back takes the lead role coming out of there and which one kind of throughout the year I think you'll see different guys up and down, more play time based off the style of play that they want to run that week. So I think we'll see a lot of... Again, the mid zone back, but I'm assuming they'll have a speedster too that they'll try and get on some reverses or they'll try and get on some end arounds to test our edges to see if our corners want to come up and make those tough tackles. And, you know, I think that all around that running back room for them is kind of a question mark for the first time in six years because Mo Ibrahim's not there. So when we were talking about um, Calig Manis and him being more of a runner and not being as consistent throwing the football, but Chris Altman, Altman Bell is back. So you got to think they're going to try to get go to the air a little bit to get him the ball, right? You would think, uh, but a lot of it's not going to be what you think. It's not going to be the long post routes or, excuse me, the long nine routes. I think it's, it's so much RPO, mm -hmm. right? They want to say, hey, can I get a slant into this dude's hand, an eight-yard slant, and can he make the safety miss and make it a 20-yard run or, you know, a screen pass on the outside? He's so dynamic with the ball in his hand that – I don't think they're going to say, hey, we're just going to line up and run different route tree combinations. It's going to be a lot of RPO, quick passes, make him create with yards after the catch. But, again, he's a guy that he'll send deep on play action. right? He might only have two or three deep, ball, deep balls a game, but all those are going to be off play action, try and catch the safeties with their nose in the backfield and see if he can't get behind them. You know? And so when you have one receiver, which they always seem to have one receiver that can do that, but you know, the guy that we really need to look out for is arguably one of the best tight ends in the country is Brevin Spanford. He's a great tight end for them. He's like six foot seven, very Austin Allen-y type of height. But he's a guy that's going to be a day two pick probably for the Minnesota Gophers this year at the tight end position. And he's a guy, too, you talk about being able to block, be able to leak out in routes and catch the ball over the middle. He's a guy we're going to have to keep an eye out for as well. All right, let's, let's flip things over to the other side and, and talk about the Nebraska offense. I mean, it's, it's just this is the one area we don't know as much about until we, we see them run out right. there. But um, I guess what, what are the big things that you're going to be looking for out of this Husker offense in game one? The biggest thing is I want to, just, I want to make sure that they just run smoothly. Right? I don't want to see guys running in and out of the huddle because we have the wrong personnel or pre-snap penalties. or you know, Operation is something that I'm going to be paying very close attention to. How do they operate and do they operate efficiently? You know, The other thing is Matt Rule's talked about it since he got here. We're going to run the football. Right? Are we going to stay committed to running the football Right? in the first, second quarter? If things aren't going well, are we going to come out in the third quarter and abandon it? Are we going to stick with it? Right, and I want to see these backs get in a rhythm, get in a groove. But you know, because also our wide receiver right now is pretty limited on depth. Right, we have Billy Kemp, we have some other guys out there, but there's no there's no Palmer to take the deep end off. You know, with Betts being gone, you know, so who's going to step up there? I do think we're going to rely a lot, and I want to see us rely a lot on the inside run game and the zone read game, allowing Sims and Irvin and Grant and Ramirez and all those guys to really be the heartbeat and what propels this offense to being successful. All right, so we do this every time. If you're a first-time listener, give me a couple players to watch offense, defense. Yeah, I mean, obviously on offense, it's going to be Jeff Sims. It's got to see how we, we went out. We got a big-name transfer. He's now the quarterback, starting quarterback, got voted single-digit number. Like, how does he operate on a hostile environment, home opener for the Gophers on Thursday night, only show on turf? You know, a lot of eyes are going to be glued into that. How does he operate? Um, another guy on offense is Billy Kemp. You know, another transfer, guys that we don't know a lot about, right? As Husker Nation, we haven't seen them wearing the scarlet and cream besides the spring game, which was the spring game, right? So how are those guys going to go, and are they main contributors for us this year? And then on defense, you know, Ty Robinson had a great game against the Gophers last year against John Michael Schmitz, who was the best center in, the, in college football last year. You know, he had a great game last year. He's going to have to show up in a big way to stop this run game. 
you know, and then I really, I'm excited to see MJ Sherman and Chief Borders. I'm excited to see what kind of physicality those guys bring to the linebacker position, the outside linebacker position, and can they get home? Can they get to the quarterback, right? We need someone that's going to show us that week in and week out we can rely on them to finish at the quarterback with sacks, hits, hurries, those type of things. I think those guys can bring that type of mentality and that type of production to this defense that we desperately need. Okay, so two biggest keys for the Huskers to leave Minneapolis with a win in the season opener. Number one, stop the run of the Gophers, right? Get them off schedule. We can't allow them to just go four yards, four yards, four yards, and just die a slow death on defense. We have to find ways to create negative plays, get them behind the sticks, and put them in obvious passing situations that they don't want to be in. And then I think a big thing, too, is going to be special teams flipping the field. I know it's usually a November thing of like, hey, we got to make sure we have field position. But when you're playing the Gophers, field position is huge, right? Because the way, the style that they want to play football, we got to make sure that they have a long way to go on offense and then give our offense a chance for some short fields. So an explosive return or making sure we make all our kicks, points will be at a premium. You know, I think special teams is a big thing there. And then the last thing, which is always and forever, is turnovers. Turnovers, turnovers, turnovers. We will live and die by that. You know, the ball is everything, I believe, is the thing I keep reading everywhere I'm around there, right? So finding a way to get the ball taken out of the offense's hands over there and making sure as an offense we have zero turnovers, right? That'd be a big win for us if we can come out of a game, season opener, new coach, new quarterback, all those things. Zero turnovers, that would be a massive win for us. Who scores the first touchdown? Ooh. I don't, I want to say Gabe Irvin. I want to say Gabe Irvin. I want to say Gabe Irvin's going to be the one to start to start us off on the right note with a nice run off the right side for 12 to 15 yards and a touchdown. I'm going to go with Jeff Sims. That's fair. That's yeah. a fair one, too. I think, I think both those guys are probably the odds-on Vegas favorites to score the first touchdown. I think you could also throw in Billy Kemp or even Anthony Grant. I mean, Coach Rule... Anthony Rules, Grant, yeah. Coach whoever Rules, starts at running back. Yeah, Coach Rule said the other day that Anthony Grant has got to take better care of the football, but when he does things right, I mean, which we, we saw, he's... he's can really make some things happen, but um, he, he's going to play. They're gonna, it's going to take both running backs, and so um, I think those four, any of those four would probably be a safe bet, but watch us be wrong on all of it. <laughs> yeah, watch it, watch watch it, it be, be the like, fullback. Yeah, watch it be the fullback or <laughs> some fat guy touchdown somehow, shape or form. Oh, awesome. Is this like one of your favorite matchups to watch the Huskers and, and Minnesota? I do. You know, mm -hmm. I, I really love this matchup just because it's, I mean, you talk about all the way back when Frost and Fleck had the little bit of beef going too. And, you know, it's always a good rivalry. We're pretty close in proximity. There's a lot of Viking fans I know that live here in, many, or in Nebraska, which means that they somewhat, shape or form, can associate with the Gophers every now and then. And, you know, this is a game that it's gone back and forth over the years, right? We've beat the tar out of them. They've beat the tar out of us. And it's been close games back and forth. But I think this is a really good rivalry game. And I love opening with a conference game. I think it just it makes everyone have to focus more, be more on P's and Q's, right, and go out there. And then obviously a night game, Thursday night. Oh, man, sign me up. I can't wait. Greg and I do not agree with you. We do not like opening up with this conference game. Well, I mean, I guess with the new coaching staff and all of that, we prefer to have uh, one or two to get under the belt. But it's exciting. It definitely does uh, kind of put a li little bit more pizzazz on this opener. Absolutely. I mean, it's, a, it's a tone setter, right? It's a tone setter for the rest of your season. Are you going to come out there and, and show the world what we're about? Or you, you get a chance of a litmus test of where you are as a team right away. All right. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you there. You're going to be there yes. in attendance. Absolutely. I will be there. Travel safe up there to Gopherville, everyone. And I hope we can walk out of there with a W. All right. Well, episode one of the sideline slice of the 2023 season. There you have it. For Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie. Thanks again for listening to this episode, and thanks to our great friends at Valentino's Pizza for making this podcast possible. Valentino's the official pizza of the Huskers. Go Big Red.